Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 137, oh, that's quite a lot, of our Planet Zoo mod spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and can, and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got quite an interesting assortment, we've got a few amphibians, we've got cool uh, uh, couple of invertebrates and we've got a couple birds, especially one very cool bird that's my logo very excited to talk about that one uh, great cake mods obviously did a very wonderful job with that one so we're going to be starting off with leaf uh doing the uh Lazarus alpine salamander so let's just pick one that's in a good light we'll have a look at you little character so this is the Lazarus alpine salamander uh also called just a large alpine salamander or salamandera lazani have you spell it uh how you it's Latin name or binomial name. As a species of sam uh, salamander from the family Salamanderidae, found in France and Italy. So it's described in in 1988, and its name means it's salamander in like Greek. And its specific name is referred to Baldino Lanza, which was an Italian herpetologist, so it's named to honor him. So you can see the species is quite interesting looking. It's got a flat head and it measures between 115 to 160 millimeters or about 4.5 to 6.3 inches in length. And the tail tip is either rounded or pointed, as you kind of see there, with or without paravertebral glands, uh, which are the glands here. And due to its black color, they can be look quite similar to other alpine salamander which is a uh, different species, but look at this cute little guy. So this species can be found in the Coltan Alps near Moslo in Govaz of Southern France, but also can be found in the Perseus and Po River. Uh, so live around like France and uh, Italy. So they love those high alpine areas. In terms of their ecology, they're very similar to other salamanders. They typically feed on insects, spiders, and various species of little slugs. Uh, very, very, um, cool in that regard so typical habitats these guys are alpine species as I suggest in the name so typically found in elevations between 1200 to 2600 uh, meters or between 3900 and 8500 feet uh, so that's 8500 so quite high uh, with a maximum being about 9200 feet or about uh, 2800 meters but in France they can be typically seen between 1800 and 2300 meters or about 5900 to 7500 feet while in Italy, they can be found a little bit lower and a little bit a uh, little bit lower at about four thousand to six thousand feet, or about one fourteen hundred fifty to twenty one hundred meters. They typically like the subalpine uh, prairies. It's a great home for them, but they also can be found in fresh, uh, humid woodlands and forests on the edge of mountainous streams. So they just like a lot of water too. So in terms of mating and reproduction for these guys, they start mating on land from like May to October, and during that time they become nocturnal, uh, but during heavy rains they actually may become diurnal too. Uh, mating uh, happens on land mostly in May, but it depends on the climate in that given year, sometimes there's some variability there. They will typically give birth to two to six young, and they are born completely formed, so they don't go through a tadpole stage like frogs do. And after mating is successfully fulfilled, uh, uh, after they made it success fulfilled, which can be as, to as long as three to four years. I think that means to be their lifespan. It's probably bad wording on the wiki. So in terms of their toxicology, they are a toxic species. So when under threat, they will release a liquid toxin through small openings on their bodies. And this is a strong liquid that can cause irritation if you like put it near your eyes. And this they typically, before they do that, they will warn predators by dipping their heads downwards when threatened. To be like, hey, don't mess with me, I'm poisonous. That's what a lot of animals like to do to protect themselves. Look at this cute little guy on there. Look at you there. So predators that would be a threat for these guys is obviously vipers, so types of snakes, and various birds. Uh, so they use that to protect themselves. And they were sadly, um, they are consider were considered vulnerable. So they have a limited range and a small distribution, but they were considered uh, vulnerable by the OCN. However, in 2022, it was listed as critically endangered by the ICCN because of the potential danger of chytrid fungus or Brachyturum salamandovorans which has been released or recorded near Germany so it's a really really bad fungus that a lot of these guys wouldn't have immunity to so they're very worried if it actually gets into the population it could really hurt them if it's allowed to spread naturally it could actually cause their extinction 
uh, within the next 40 years, and possibly sooner, sooner if we inter uh, directly introduce it to these guys, so very, very careful. It's uh, something that could really has the potential to wipe out the species, so that's why they've been boosted up from vulnerable to critically endangered, so we want to make sure that they're doing all right. So yeah, sad, a sad story, but still really, really cool little guys. I love these little salamanders. They don't deserve extinction. So really, really awesome there. So next species, so that one was done by Leaf. This one's done by Leaf and Nick. We've got the Emperor Newt. Really, really cool guy. So let's have a look in there. That's not what we wanted. Uh, so let's have a look. Here's the Emperor Newt. Sitting right in the corner there. Let's see if we can find him a little bit more out in the open. Look at these little cuties. They're actually such little cuties. Hello, it's you. You're having a little sleep there, little friend little friend. So this is the uh, called Tylotron Saojong, I believe you say that. Tylotriton. It's also named the Emperor Newt, but they also be called the Mandarin Newt or the Mandarin Salamander. So these guys are highly toxic Newt from Yunnan and parts of southern China and are sometimes kept in private collections and can be available for sale, but you got to be very, very careful. So, in terms of its uh, description, these guys get to about 8 centimeters or, uh, or about 8 inches long. Uh, 20 centimeters or about 8 inches long. They have like this, you can see this ridged orange head. And then you can have this like dark line down their back. Uh, their tail and arms are all, and legs are also white. But you can see these little dots going along their side there. That is actually uh, their poison glands. So these are where they secrete their poison. Uh, and they're typically all the same shade of orange so that can vary depending on population, diet, etc, etc. It's one of those things, there's just lots of variation there. So in terms of defense, that's what they use mainly their poison for. So they may be slow, but they um, use their bright orange correlation to kind of scare anything away. So typically in nature, if you're brightly colored like that, it means you're poisonous. Lots of animals use it, lots of insects, reptiles, uh, amphibians, and even some fish and birds will use these bright colors to be like, hey, don't mess with me, I'm poisonous. Uh, that's kind of the point of them. So uh, when the newt is grand, it actually, the tip of their ribs will squeeze the poison out of their glands to make sure that it secretes. And uh, in part, they actually have quite powerful toxins. So they have been uh, uh, killed approximately about 70,500 mice. So quite powerful. And therefore, most larger animals will avoid this newt, but typically they are nocturnal and like to live in the leaf litter, so they're typically hard to find. So if an animal also attempts to bite into it, the top of the newt's vertebrae and skull have especially thick bones. They are protected, and also if, they've put, if they're poisonous if eaten, uh, or if they're toxin injected, they're generally safe for human handling, so don't eat them, but you can handle them safely. But you need to make sure you hold, hold them gently, maybe even get them used to, if they're used to it, they might like secrete, so just make sure to hold them gently. And also, uh, another thing to do is make sure you wear either non-powdered uh, latex or nylon gloves, should be worn by the handler, not only to protect you from the poison, but to protect the salamander. Because uh, most amphibians have very, very uh, permeable skin, so lots of things get their skin, so any sort of oils or soaps or anything can be quite harmful to these guys. So, so wearing gloves when handling species like this that are poisonous is not just for your safety, it's for their safety as well. So make sure to wear anything and also wash your hands before and afterwards just to help protect, you know, make sure our little guys are okay because we want to make sure, if you have a pet one, you want to make sure it's happy and healthy, so make sure to wear your gloves. So in terms of its range and habitat, these guys are typically found around central, western and southern Yunnan in China between about 1,000 to 2,500 meters above sea level and typically love slow moving streams and pools in subtropical forests. So in terms of their diet as well, not too different from most other species of salamanders. They like to eat small invertebrates, such as crickets and worms, pretty much anything they could get their mouths around. They're not very picky. But in captivity, they'll be typically fed waxworms, crickets, and earthworms. Those are the things they'll be typically fed. And actually for a long time, they were actually considered uh, together with the Himalayan newt, but then were split into their own species about 1995. So really really cool guy I definitely love them love them love them love them and look at all these cool little guys hiding in here so this one is done by leaf and nick both did a wonderful job so next up we're going to have a look at some invertebrates don't do that to me please we're going to have a look at the carpathian blue slug have a look at you there you look like a perfect position to be talked about 
So this is Belize colorans, which is known as Carpathian blue slug, or just simply blue slug. They're a very, very large species of land slug, which is the family Lamayidae, which is called the keelback slugs. So it discovered in 1847 uh, and under the name Limax colorans, but then they were named as their own genus uh, and the only species in their genus, Belenzia, which was named after the uh, malacologist Michael Belenzia, so guys who studies like snails and mollusks and things like that. So uh, that's why they're named there. And this species is typically only found uh, to the Carpathian Mountains in Central Eastern Europe. So they're going to be found in Romania, the Czech Republic, Southern Poland, Slovenia, Ukraine, Romania, Hungary, and Germany, where they've been introduced, uh, which is pretty interesting. So this striking color you can see here is only an adult. So they typically will turn blue uh, when an adult and becomes about 100 to 140 millimeters in length, about 10 to 14 centimeters. And as you can see, evenly blue or bluish green, occasionally sometimes black as well, with a dark grayish head and tentacles, and uh, margins are pale yellowish, and sole pale yellowish to whitish. So yeah, pretty much looks like that. Uh, juveniles though don't have the same sort of color. They're typically covered in yellowish, uh, yellowish brown with dark bands, uh, which is interesting as well. And in terms of reproduction, they don't have the male reproductive organ, and it's, there is only an accessory organ for copulation, so they don't have the male reproductive organ. In terms of their habitat, they typically live in deciduous and coniferous forests, uh, in mountains, usually at the bottom of or under dead logs, uh, things like that, dead woods and logs and things like that, so they're like hiding. Uh, typically, they reach maturity at about June to July, with copulation occurring in the soil. There are about 30 to 80 eggs laid in one clutch, and adults will die after egg deposition. And typically, uh, half-grown juveniles will hibernate, and then the first born grown slugs will appear in May. So that's quite interesting. So a little interesting life cycle for these guys, and look at all these wonderful slugs. Definitely a big fan of some more slugs. So speaking of invertebrates, we have now got the biggest invertebrate of all time. Uh, not all time, uh, around today. That was a bit of an exaggeration. So let's have a look at you. So there's a couple here. Uh, it's kind of hard with the size of them, but we will talk about them anyway. So this is the coconut crab. So this was done by Leaf and Nick. Really did a wonderful job. So there are species of giant hermit crab, also known as the robber or palm thief crab. And they're the largest terrestrial vertebrate known today, uh, which is quite interesting. And the only species in the genus as well. So as I mentioned, in, in, oh, I'll talk about. So the coconut crab was best known to Western scientists at the voyages of, uh, voyages of Francis Drake, about 1580. And um, their name kind of means it's cancer cumuleris, which is cancer. Uh, uh, Latter means it means robber. And the, the genus Burgus was uh, erected in 1816, uh, which replaced cancer. And, um, and the family Colobellidae, which are little genus of, like other hermit crabs. So they are related to hermit crabs. And they were quite old lineage, they date all the way back to the Miocene, so they're at least 5 million years old. And common names as mentioned as like uh, coconut crab, robber crab, or palm thief, with um, different variations along that. So they are the largest living terrestrial arthropod and the largest living terrestrial invertebrate. So reports uh, their size vary, but they, most sources put them about 40 centimeters or about 16 inches long and weigh up to about 4.1 kilograms or 9 pounds with a leg span of about 0.91 meters or so just under uh, about 3 feet with males generally be a little bit larger than females. The carapace may reach about 78 millimeters or about 3 or 16th of an inch length and have a width of about 200 millimeters or about 8 inches. So the body of the coconut crab is like um, like all decapods, separated into the front section, which is the cephalothorax, which means basically head body, and then you have ten legs and abdomen. They also have the frontmost pair of large claws. You can see with the left being larger than the right. Uh, they use these large, powerful legs for both walking and climbing. The fourth pair of legs are small tweezer-like that allow young coconut crabs to gr grip into the husks of um, grip inside the shell of coconut husks and kind of. Uh, be crowd for protection, which is quite cool. The last pair of legs is very small and used by females to tend to the eggs. So each kind of leg pair has almost got like a little use of it. And some differences in colors do occur in different islands where they're found. So typically they can be all orange, red to purple, bluish. Uh, but some places they can be more commonly blue. And some places like the Seychelles, most individuals are red. So even though they're a derived type of hermit crab, only juveniles will actually use salvaged snails, snails 
to protect their soft abdomens. Adults will actually sometimes use broken coconut shells. Adolescents will use broken coconut shells for the same purpose. But uh, unlike other hermit crabs, these guys do not carry around a shell, as but they harden their uh, their base of the ab abdomen or their um, turga with chitin and calcium carbonate, so they're able to kind of protect themselves like that. They don't need a shell. So the hardest uh, hard anatomy protects the coconut crab from reduced loss of water, but they must be periodically malted. So they'll molt annually every year. So they dig a burrow up to about a meter deep. Uh, or a meter long, where they hide while their soft shell hardens, and depending on their size, it can be about one to three weeks is needed for the exoskeleton to harden, and the animal will remain in their burrow for three to sixteen weeks, again, depending on their size. So in terms of respiration, except for larvae, they cannot swim, and they actually drown if left in water for more than an hour. So they actually use a special organ called a brachiostegal lung to breathe, so it can almost be interpreted as like a developmental stage between lungs and gills or gills and lungs, and it's actually quite a significant adaptation to allow them to live on land. So they contain a tissue similar to what is found in gills that is suited for absorbing oxygen from air rather than water, and the organ is expanded laterally and is an evagulated uh, to increase the surface area, and it's located on the cephalothorax here, and it's uh, optimally placed to reduce both the blood and gas diffusion as well. And they also have the use their hind limbs to clean their breathing organs and moisten it with water, so they're able to constantly uh, moisten them as well. And the organs require water to properly function, so they're comp constantly kind of stroking its wet legs over spongy tissue and things like that. So they're allowed to do that well. And in terms of coconut crabs, actually have a well-developed sense of smell, which they use to locate food. And crabs that live in water uh, have specialized uh, organs called anthesis on their antennae. Uh, these guys are a little bit different. And when insects and coconut crab originate from different clades, the same need to track the smell actually shows convergent evolution with a lot of insects. So they're able to flick their antennae to enhance their uh, chemical reception. And their brains of coconut crabs show that their split sense of smell was well developed, so allow them to kind of go out and smell for food, which is quite interesting. So in terms of their life cycle, they mate frequently and quickly on dry land on a period of May to September, especially during early to June, June to late August. So males have spermatophores and deposit a mass of spermatophores on the abdomens of a female and the overduct opens to the base of the third period and fertilization sought to happen through the surface of the abdomen. So this uh, happens on land or in crevices and burrows of the shore. Then the female will lay her eggs shortly after mating and glue them to the undersides of their abdomen and carry around the fertilized eggs underneath her for a few months. And at the time of hatching, the female coconut crab will mig migrate to the seashore and release the larvae into the ocean. The coconut crab actually takes a large risk while laying these eggs as they cannot swim. And if coconut crabs fall into water or slipped away, their weight makes it possible for them to swim back to dry land, so it's actually quite risky for them. The egg laying stage will typically play, uh, place on a rocky shore or at dusk, where it's at high tide, and the empty egg cases will remain on the female's body after the larvae have been released, and then the eggs, uh, the female eats the eggs cases within a few days. <coughs> So the larval float around in the pelagic uh, zone of the ocean as plankton for about three to four weeks, and a large number are eaten by predators, and then larvae pass a few to five zoa stages before molting, which is a process of about 25 to 35 days. And once they reach the glulatho stage, they settle to the bottom and find a gastropod shell and migrate to the shore like other hermit crabs. Um, and at that time, they will sometimes visit dry land, and afterwards they leave the water permanently once they reach maturity or become adolescents. Uh, young coconut crabs cannot find a seashell on the right size, often use broken coconut pieces. And then once they develop their hardened shell, uh, they develop their hardened, when they grow this, they develop a hardened abdomen, and the coconut crab will reach sexual maturity at about five years after hatching. And they reach their maximum size only about 40 to 60 years, and may live up to 120 years, so quite long lived. So in terms of their distribution, they can be found on the Indian Ocean and Central Pacific Ocean, uh, with their distribution actually closely matching the coconut palm. So the western limit is kind of Zanzibar and Rotropo de Cancer, so the Indian and uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, some evidence suggests that they used to live on mainlands of Australia, Madagascar, Rodriguez, Easter Island, Toledo, and the Macros Islands, and possibly India, India, but they were extirpated, which is a little bit sad, so hopefully some reintroductions for that. And there's, as they cannot swim, they have to colonize islands as babies, as they are plectonic larvae, so adults are typically have to live on the islands. Christmas Island, though, is one of the largest and densest population of coconut crabs in the world. Uh, other populations in the Indian Ocean, as the Seychelles, and in the Pacific, they have been seen to have been found on all sorts of different islands, the Cook Islands, uh, Rarotonga, things like that. Found all sorts of different places. So let me just quickly 
have a drink. Just needed to... My throat's a bit itchy. That's right. So typically in terms of diets, coconut crabs typically feed on freshy fruits, fleshy fruits, nuts, uh, droops and seeds, and the pips of fallen trees. However, they are omnivores and have been known to eat organic materials such as tortoise hatchlings and dead animals. Been known to scavenging, and even there's been one uh, experiment of seeing a coconut crab hunt and kill a um, Polynesian rat, which is interesting, and also another one dismembering a red-footed booby. So they are pretty generalist. And the coconut crab can actually take the uh, coconut from the ground and cut it into its husk, uh, take its core, climb up 10 meters, and then drop the husk to access the uh, fresh inside. And they have very, very powerful pincers to allow them to break open things. But they're able to climb trees for actually grab coconuts, drop them, and break into them. So that's a really, really interesting thing about their ecology. In terms of their habitat, they're actually considered one of the most terrestrially adapted types of decapods. And most aspects of their life are oriented around uh, kind of uh, land. Though they do have to raise their babies and release them to the water, and that's how they spread. So they typically live alone in burrows or rock crevasses, depending on local terrain. They'll dig their own burrows in sand or loose soil. And during the day, they'll actually stay hidden to reduce water loss. And the coconut crabs burrow broken by very strong fibers of the coconut husk that they use for bedding. So they like making the coconut husk as bedding. And while resting its burrow, the entrance, it'll close the entrance one of its claws, creating a moist microclimate for it to hide and keep it itself nice and um, moist so it can breathe. And in areas with large coconut populations, uh, uh, or large coconut crab populations, they some may come out during the day to get an advantage of searching for food, and other times they mostly will come out whether it's moist or raining, uh, since the conditions allow them to breathe easier. And they live almost exclusively on land, returning only to sea as, uh, to release their eggs. Even on Christmas Island, they can be found six kilometers away from the sea. So relationship with humans, humans had a very complex relationship. They have no known predators other than other coconut crabs and humans. Their large uh, size and quality of meat has, uh, means they've been excessively hunted, often considered a delicacy on most places. And while they're not considered poisonous typically, they have maybe depending on their diets, so maybe a little bit poisonous than others, such as sea mangoes, so it's got to be careful. And those pincers can be quite harmful to people since uh, they've been caused pain and they can often keep holding for them uh, a long period of time. So you've got to be very careful with those. And in terms of conservation, they are sadly considered vulnerable. So they are several areas where they lived because of humans. They've become locally extinct both by both habitat loss and human uh, predation. So they've been considered data deficient and now they're considered vulnerable. But there's likely lots of conservation strategies to try and give limits and to protect egg-breathing females to help the populations and seasons and things like that, depending on different places, especially like Guam and Vanuatu. Uh, but hopefully there's some more efforts. I'd really like to see some reintroduction efforts to like Madagascar and like India, potentially, or even Australia. And that would be really cool. But yeah, really, really awesome species to talk about. Definitely love the coconut crab. Such an awesome animal. Love those guys. So next up, uh, so that was done by Lee Fanet. Next up, we've got by Jorna Pizza and Garboy. We've got a remake of the Barbary Macaque. So let's have a look at these wonderful guys. So this is the Barbary Macaque, uh, also known as the Barbary Ape. These are a species of macaque native to the Atlas Mountains of Algeria, although there's a small population in Gibraltar, which is quite interesting. So in terms of their phylogeny, they consider the most basal macaque species. So they are more closely related things like the Cerebus crested macaque and lion-tailed macaque. Uh, and a lot of other species are considered very basal to the tree since they're pretty much African. Most are a lot more uh, found a lot more in Southeast Asia and Asia, places like that. So they are considered quite basal, which is quite awesome. And the fossil record actually shows they may have been found across Europe from the Atlantic Ocean to the Black Sea dating to the early Pliocene, so about five to three million years ago. And during the late Pliocene, they may have been some subspecies of them living on islands, uh, smaller islands. And even more recently, there have been some evidence of them living between 85 to 40,000 years ago in like Germany, Barbara and things like that. And even sometimes into uh, England, into the northern Pleistocene. So when it was during interglacials where it was much warmer, they did live up more to Europe. But at the moment, they only are found in Gibraltar. Uh, and as I mentioned, northern Africa. In terms of their description though, they have, you can see they have this dark pink face with a pale buff or golden bright pelt. You can see going on there. In adults or sub-adults, the fur is black with uh, pale or dark patterns. That depends on the individual. And But a spring and early summer, when temperature rises, they'll molt, molt from their uh, thick winter coat. 
And they do show sexual dimorphism, so males are typically much bigger than females, with the head-to-body length being typically between 55.7 or 21.9 inches in females, and 63.4 or 25 inches in males. They do have also a boneless vestigial tail, as you kind of see there, and it's greatly reduced uh, compared with most uh, macaque species, if not absent. But males have uh, more prominent tails, the Dato scarus, and the average body weight ratio is about 9 to 11 kgs in females and about 14 and a half to 15 kgs, or about 20 to 24 to 32 to 35 pounds for males and females respectively. So um, also like old world monkeys, they have well-developed sitting pads on their back so they can sit on things as well. They also have anogenital swelling that increases the size during estrus. They have large teeth, uh, not too different from other guys. So as I mentioned, historically, these guys would have uh, ranged across uh, North Africa to Libya to Morocco, and the only African primate that survives north of the Sahara Desert. Mainly fragmented habitats now, uh, like the High Atlas Mountains, things like that, and have been reported in uh, Algeria. And um, the, uh, the Moroccan and Algerian populations are about 700 kilometers apart, although that gap was much smaller during the Holocene, so that probably allowed them to spread. They've also also occur in the British Overseas Territory of Gibraltar, which is they were introduced there. But it seems there's about 300 living there. But it seems like during interglacials they would have lived around southern Europe and even during interglacial periods into Europe. So it's kind of like a, a Pleistocene rewilding unintentionally that they were found there. But uh, it's kind of yeah, they, the population is kind of invasive. But they did originally live there during the Ice Age, so it's not too much of a big problem. It's just mainly the problem to people living in there. But they can live in a variety of different habitats. They prefer that Mediterranean climate. They're like cedar, fir, and oak forests. Also grasslands and ridges and things like that. And in Morocco, they typically like Atlas cedar forests, but have different preferences. In other places, they can like home oaks and Portuguese and core oak forests, so they typically like those kind of forests. So in terms of their behavior, not too different from a lot of other species of macaques. So they're gregarious. They form mixed groups of several male to females, with troops being between 10 and 100 individuals, and are matriarchal, with the hierarchy typically uh, discerned by lineage to the lead female. And unlike other macaques, uh, the males will participate in rearing the young. They also spend quite a considerable amount of time grooming each other and uh, infants as well, and form strong social bonds with both offspring and those of others in the troop. And this is a result of selectivity in part of the female, who mainly prefer highly paternal males. So typically the breeding season for these guys runs from November through March, with the gestation being about 147 to 192 days. And we'll talk about that. Let's have a look at that little baby down there. It's a little, little baby. And females usually has, only have one or two offspring per pregnancy. Sometimes uh, they'll raise twins, but typically they won't. Typically, uh, offspring uh, reach maturity about three to four years of age and may live up to 20 years or more in the wild. So grooming uh, other barbary macaques is really important as it leads to lower stress levels. And they do not appear to be reduced if animals are groomed. Grooming more individuals have an even lower stress level and kind of reinforces those bonds. And they'll also uh, interfere with males or over conflicts or form coalitions with other males, usually with related rather than unrelated males. So this is to show their fitness, and these are not permanent coalitions, but they're trying to find power and avoiding conflicts. They typically try to avoid conflicts with higher ranking males, so it's constantly like drama, Shortland Street, to try and find out where they are on the hierarchy. And in terms of alarm calls, uh, the main purpose of alarm calls are like uh, to allow for predators. And they can distinguish calls of different individuals based on um, kind of acoustic variation, like pitch and loudness, different individuals. And they can actually recognize their own offspring's calls uh, through a variety of parameters. So infants do not have to differ directly, uh, dramatically from mother to be able to recognize their own infant's calls. So they're pretty much able to hear each other and, you know, identify each other pretty easily. Let's look at another one over there. So in terms of mating, they are sexually active at all points during the female reproductive cycle, and they have fem uh, swellings uh, of their kind of areas, and then the males can mate with them. And they actually differ from most other non-human primates, as they often uh, mate, the females will actually mate with the majority of males in the social group. And while females are active in choosing sexual associations, the mating behaviors, these are not entirely determined by female choice. So these are molting, multiple mating by females uh, decrease by the certainty of paternity, so they kind of lead them to care of all of them, because maybe just one of them may be mine, kind of, that kind of thing. They are considered uh, good parents, as I mentioned, they are considered quite good parents, even males being uncharacteristically good parents compared to a lot of other macaques, as, as I mentioned, because females have more of a choice, it might be just taking care of more babies means it's more likely that one of them is yours and you'll be doing fine. 
In terms of their diet though, they eat uh, all sorts of different plants and insect prey. They feed on a variety of gyno and amnosperms. And almost every part of the plant is eaten, including flowers, fruits, seedlings, leaves, bar, bubs, uh, bark, gum, roots, everything. A common prey for these guys in terms of animals, they'll feed com uh, on sa snails, earthworms, scorpions, sa uh, spiders, centipedes, water slider, scale insects, uh, moths, ants, even tadpoles. And they've just been known to cause major damage to rainforests uh, in their habitat. And so they are because they have to strip bark. Uh, which is sometimes uh, areas of high density of macaques that can be a big issue in the rainforest. So there's been trying to harp conflicts with that. And in terms of predators, their main predators are typically domestic dogs, leopards and eagles, with the golden eagle maybe playing on babies, since they're not really adapted for hunting primates. And they have different calls. Uh, the approach of eagles and domestic dogs have known to elicit alarm calls. So in terms of their habitat or oh, well, threats, these guys, uh, I believe, are considered endangered. Yep, they are considered endangered since they are uh, some threats that they have to deal with. So wild populations of barbary macaques have suffered a major decline due to, and been declared a day's base of species, mainly because of habitat fragmentation, uh, destruction of forest habitat, and poaching for the illegal pet trade is a big bit issue. They've also been killed in raids, which is a little bit sad. And uh, mainly like logging activity, so local farmers regard them as a pest. And then once thought common throughout Northern Africa and Southern Mediterranean Europe, there was one estimated to be between 12 to 21,000 in uh, Barbary macaques left in Morocco and Algeria, but that population has definitely gone down. And uh, as I mentioned during like the Ice Age and the, their populations had definitely declined since then, as I mentioned, they did probably live in the United Kingdom during the Ice Age or during the glaciers of the Ice Age. And probably went extinct uh, from the Gibraltar about 30,000 years ago. But they've been reintroduced, so it's plus similar wilding. They are threatened, as I mentioned, by habitat loss, overgrazing, and uh, capture. So people chopping down their forests, the story, story is tale as old as time. Uh, they raid crops, so a lot of farmers kill them. But also catching them illegally for the pet trade. And also human use and tourism is a big issue. They were used to study human anatomy and lots of them dissections as well. Since obviously you can't do that much on people. Uh, they've been exported for pets and also fighting monkeys and used for tourism, uh, which is really sad. But um, they are considered endangered, well, as I mentioned. But luckily, hopefully, there's some efforts to protect these guys. Uh, their legal trade is obviously illegal, so that's a good thing. It's just making sure that these guys are okay. Really, really cool animals. Definitely a big fan. So yeah, that's the Barbary Macaque, done by Jorna Pizza and Gaboy. Gaboy remastered, did a really good job. So next animal we got here is done by Narwhala. We have got the Cape Baron Goose. A really, really cool little guy here. So the Cape Baron Goose, or Serapis Nova Hollandiae, also known as the Pig Goose, or the Pig-Nosed Goose, is a species of goose endemic to Australia, and it's quite a distinctly large bird that is mostly terrestrial. So the Cape Baron Goose was first described by English ornithologist John Latham uh, in 1801 as Serapis in Hollandi. And the taxonomic placement of the species has been a little bit, yeah, but they are considered to be their own tribe. And there's considered a couple of different subspecies, like the Northern Australian one, uh, Southeast Australia and Southwestern Australia one. Though in their same genus as well, there are a couple of extinct species, I believe, like um, the giant North and South uh, Island, not South American, South Island uh, swans and uh, the geese or goose, think probably a better way to put it. So these guys are quite large birds. They typically measure between 75 to 100 centimeters or 30 to 39 inches long and weigh between 3.7 and 5.2 kilograms or about 8 to 11 pounds with males generally being a little bit larger than the females. So you can see their plumage is mainly a pale gray with a slight brown tint and the head is actually somewhat small compared to the proportions of their body uh, uh, save um, also small and mostly gray in color save for a palish white patch on their head on their crown and forehead. Their bill is quite short, it only measures between 56 and 63 millimeters, or about 2 to 2.5 inches, and quite triangular in shape, where they kind of get the name Pycnones, they've got a short beak, compared to a lot of other um, goose. And it's uh, you can see it's probably a yellow-green color with a little bit on the front. And feathers of the breast and black uh, are typically a brownish-gray, and the flight feathers are gray with a black tip. And the black extending color on the distal half, right back there. So typically, and pink feet, uh, I mean... Pink legs and black feet, so really not too uh, striking in terms of colors, but still a really awesome animal regardless. They've got a very interesting pig look to them, you know, a very characteristic big nose. I like that. So typically uh, newly hatched uh, goslings, you can see, 
little little guys here. So there's a Ryan. <laughs> that's funny, Ryan Gosling. Ha ha ha. I uh, love that guy. Anyway, newly hatched goslings are white with uh, broad, da uh, broad dark stripes with a dark crew. And older individuals tend to be a paler grey with heavy spotting and more similar to adults. And this grey will turn about a yellowish green colour at about uh, 70 days and juveniles will molt at about 6 months old. So we'll have a, we're going to stick with Ryan Gosling for the moment. I think that's quite funny. That shows sometimes how life works, you know, sometimes just things just happen. So these guys are largely terrestrial and don't swim actually that often. They are predominantly grazers, feeding on hedges and uh, succulents, things like that, all sorts of uh, plants. They also can produce a high-pitched honking call, often during takeoff or in flight, with both sexes making low pig-like grunts and hisses when alarmed. And goslings will produce like a whistling uh, distress call. Uh, Cape Baron groups are also monogamous and they will pair for life. Uh, after mating, they'll perform a triumph ceremony where they'll lower their heads while facing each other and call loudly, and pairs will establish territories in autumn, and breeding occurs in the winter. So pairs will typically nest singly or in loose colonies. So we'll have a look at these other guys here. Let me have a look at eating. Uh, loose colonies. And the nest is typically shallow, uh, hold line with vegetation and down, typically found across uh, amongst tussock grasses or rocks or bushes. And this nest is mainly constructed by the male, but lined by the female. They typically will lay four to five creamy white eggs in one to three day intervals, and the eggs incubated by the female for about 34 to 37 days, with both parents caring for the young one that they've hatched. They're also really interesting as they are quite capable of drinking salt and brackish water, so which allows them to remain off on offshore islands year round. And in terms of their habitat, uh, there have been previous declines uh, numbered in the species have been reserved to birds of the east, as they are uh, least adapted to breeding uh, in agricultural land. The breeding areas of grassy islands off the coast where the species nests on the ground. And breeding pairs are strongly territorial. They also breed in captivity well, so quite uh, well with a breeding confinement of large enough paddocks are provided. So they definitely do can do well in captivity. And they have been introduced into New Zealand. Uh, a small population has been introduced to Christchurch. Uh, but also uh, there were the North and South Island goose that are related to these guys, so it's... Uh, not that weird for them. And there's a small number of geese on Maria Island off the coast of Tasmania. So they are doing alright and typically quite cool. I believe they're considered least concerned. Yep. Really, really cool animals. Uh, really nice to see that. But I love that Ryan Gosling. That was quite fun. Let's see if we can find him again. Harry, Matilda. There we are. Ryan Gosling, my little friend here. <laughs> awesome. So anyway, we're going to move on to our last animal, one I'm really excited to talk about. So this was done by Great Cake Mods, who really did a wonderful job. We have got the Kakapo. So the Kakapo, really interesting animal. So it is Stegorops haplorinia, let's say that. It is also called the owl parrot or moss chicken, playfully. There's this large species of nocturnal parrot uh, that's the only one that can't fly. It's uh, flightless and is uh, a member of the New Zealand parrots along with the kaka and the kia. Uh, and is the endemic only found in New Zealand. So it was formally described in 1845 by ornithologist uh, George Robert Gray and gave him the bobby name Cygnops uh, haplorus, which kind of means, and as I said, it was a remarkable bird. So it kind of name means stronops, which is owl. So owl face with soft feathers. Uh, was this, so haplorus means soft feather. So it's an owl face with soft feathers. And the name Kakapo is it means in Māori is uh, night parrot. So Kaka is parrot, like the Kaka. Kakariki is green parrot. So like the smaller, if you've heard of the smaller like parrots you get in New Zealand, like the kaka, uh, the red crown, the yellow crown, and orange crown Kakariki, that's kind of parrot. Uh, po means night, so it's the night parrot since they're nocturnal. And then the family Trichopodidae, as I mentioned, with the Kia and the Kaka, and it only found New Zealand. They're considered also quite basal to the group for parrots. Uh, they split from the other Sataka forms, I believe to be about about 40 million years ago at least, which is quite interesting. So the Kakapo, you can see, are quite a large round parrot. They're also the largest species. Uh, not the longest, but they are the heaviest. Uh, so adults measure between 58 to 64 centimeters, or about 23 to 25 inches long, with a wingspan about 32 inches, or about 82 centimeters. Males are significantly larger than uh, females, with an average weight about 2 kilograms, or 4.4 pounds, compared to just 1.5 kilograms in females. And they're the heaviest living species of parrot, being about 400 grams heavier, or 14 ounces more than the highest of the core, which is the next largest species, which is the largest flying parrot. 
but they're allowed to be heavier because they cannot fly, so they have relatively short wings. Uh, but they don't. They still use their wings, though. They use them since the guys are such adept climbers. They actually use their wings to parachute when they jump out of trees, which is quite interesting. And uh, they also have large amounts of body fat, which is really interesting for parrots. So they, you can see this color here. They're also covered with uh, darkish. You can see dark colors. Um, they're almost like a moss green, yellowish moss green with like dark patterns on them, and that allows them to blend into native vegetation. So they also show various degrees of mottling and things like that, and lots of variety of yellow. So there's lots of difference between individual. So it allows them to kind of uh, blend into the habitat. And there has been some reports of uh, yellowish kakapo, which is quite interesting. Though they're mostly extinct now, there's like museum specimens with those colors. But um, yeah, they also have this face disc you can see going on here, very similar to owls, where they get the name owl parrot. Uh, Mainly probably because they keep water off their face, but also potentially help with like sound because these guys rely on sound a lot to communicate. And they also have vibrissae, which allow them to feel around and kind of feel for um, anything, which is quite cool. And females can typically, uh, they've also got zygodactyl feet, which means they've got two feet going back, two, two fingers going back to front that allow them to climb, very similar to other parrots. And females can be quite uh, d easily distinguished from males as they have a narrower and less domed head and proportionally smaller, longer beaks as well. And they also have a brood patch of bare skin on their belly. And though uh, females tend to be more subtle in coloration. And so the little young of our trishal, you know, little baby kakapo, they're tipping in a greenish white down that their pink skin they can be seen easily. So we'll actually talk about little babies here. Well, there's actually one up here. So this is a little baby. So they uh, can be pink skinned. They typically become fully feathered about 70 days old and juvenile individuals tend to be duller green, more uniform black barring, and then basically just become an indistinguishable. And uh, talking about their calls, we'll talk about their calls soon when they talk about reproduction. So we know a lot about their reproduction because we try breeding them. They make a variety of calls, especially dark boom, uh, really dark, deep booms. And they have a well-developed uh, sense of smell, well-adapted for foraging at night. Uh, and they also have a very strong musky smell, if you've ever been around them. That is actually one of the reasons why they are so endangered, as we'll get into. And they're a nocturnal species, so they have uh, well-adapted eyes um, to be able to see at night. So they are uh, eyes best function around twilight, and they have increased light sensitivity, so they're able to see at night. So in terms of their anatomy, um, they're not too different from most other species of uh, parrot uh, when you look at their skeleton they just have smaller wings they have a small keel uh, they also have non-fused clavicles uh, uh, well they also have a quite a large pelvis as well since they're carrying a lot more mass and um, we actually have a good idea of the genetics as well because their population declines so much uh, beginning of 2015 the uh, kakapo 125 project has actually uh, got the genome of every living kakapo at the time which is quite interesting and there's been some research looking at to uh, the population genetics so because uh, most of the population is descended from Stewart Island, which is a small island, uh, they've actually been a little bit more inbred, but a lot of the harmful mutations have been purged compared to the number of ma um, mature um, mainland individuals. And it's been going, they've been isolated for about 10,000 years. So they kind of purified all those bad genes. And even though they're more closely related to each other, they have kind of reached a state where they've got rid of a lot of their bad genes. So they are surviving, which is quite interesting. So in terms of the habitat, they are considered habitat generalists. Uh, so they used to live all over New Zealand, living in tussocks, coastal areas, forests with podocarps, particularly rimu, uh, pretty much every habitat uh, you could find. But um, they used to live through both islands, and though they may have an absolute, they have not been found there, just, uh, fossils. So they are considered habitat journalists, they used to live all over, but sadly because of introduced predators. So the habitats are fine, if we didn't have any uh, predators, like introduced predators like rats and stoats, they'd do fine on mainland New Zealand, but sadly because of them they are... Uh, were confined to offshore islands and predator-free sanctuaries. So in terms of the behavior, typically nocturnal. They cannot fly, but they're excellent climbers. They typically like to climb to find all sorts of seeds and berries and things. These are also plants and seeds and berries, especially rimu. That's really important for them. Uh, but they're able to parachute down with their wings. They have a very low metabolism as well compared to a lot of other birds uh, because they can survive on eating very little or very low quality food since these guys eat a lot more plants uh, and things like that. And unlike most of the species, they're entirely herbivorous, so they feed on fruits, stems, leaves, uh, stems, and ribosomes, and um, which is quite interesting. 
And they have quite strong legs, as I mentioned, bigger pelvis, able to walk long, large distances. And often babies will play, fight, and they're quite curious in nature. So people that have uh, worked with kakapo, you know, find them so curious, and they have very distinct personalities. But they are solitary birds. They may be more social. There's more research suggesting that they may be a little bit more social than we realised. In terms of uh, their success in pre-human New Zealand, they were very successful. They were one of the most common birds in New Zealand. And because of this, they had, and because New Zealand didn't have any mammal predators, they are well adapted more to predators such as New Zealand falcons and harsh eagles and harriers, which were birds of prey. So all these raptors kind of had great eyesight, not that good a smell, and so they relied on that good camouflage. So t instead of, like most other animals, they, f uh, they freeze when they see... Uh, Think something overhead, or they see a predator, they uh, sense a predator, they'll freeze, rely on that camouflage, because that's uh, because birds usually rely on sight more than smell. But because of uh, rats and I mean rat, not rats, but cats and stoats rely more on smell, they can still smell out the kakapo because they have quite a musky smell, uh, even if they're frozen and just kill them while they get there like that. So they're not really used against mammal predators, which is really sad. But um, luckily, there's lots of efforts into breeding them, and they're just we're just going to go over more and more about how weird they are. So kakapo are actually the only flightless bird that have a lack system. So males will typically loosely gather an area and compete with uh, to attract females, and a lack is what they found. So typically during the uh, courting season, they will leave their home range and find uh, ridges and tops, uh, hilltops where they can broadcast their booms. So uh, these licks can be up to five uh, kilometers away from a normal territory. And then what they do is they'll dig a bowl or a shallow depression in the earth. And then they'll blow themselves up and then create these really, really dark booming mating calls that can be heard across kilometers. And they're like uh, they're made from their thoracic sac sacs. So it's like a ching, which is really, really interesting. And it can be heard kilometers away. On an average, they'll boom about eight hours a night. And males produce thousands of bo booms in there this time. And they may continue until they even lose half their body weight, just trying to get get traction. So, and that bowl, and also where they place the bowl, so also like higher up in elevations, they're able to broadcast the small, so that allows them to go out and attract females, which is quite interesting. Let's have a look at the female over here. So typically females are attracted to the boons of these males, and they too need to walk up to them, and then they'll court each other and mate, of course. Uh, they'll display, and then they'll copulate for about 40 minutes. And then she's pregnant, goes off, lays her eggs. She'll find a little hole to um, find while well, the male continues booming, trying to find another female. So in terms of the female, the female kakapo lives about, uh, lays about uh, one to four eggs during the breeding cycle, with several days between those eggs. And the nests are placed at the ground under the cover of plants or in cavities such as hollow tree trunks. The female will then incubate the eggs at least, uh, but is forced to leave every night to find food. Predators are known to eat the eggs and they can die of the cold if their mother's not around, if she, whatever happened to her. But um, typically things like rats will eat the eggs. Uh, that's why they found it offshore islands now. So kakapo eggs will usually hatch between uh, within 30 days, and being fluffy grey chicks are typically helpless. The mother will then feed them for about three months, and the chicks will remain in the, with their mother about uh, for the months after fledging. And the young chicks are just as vulnerable to predators as the eggs. So many young predators, like you know rats and things, uh, get these guys at a young age. Chicks will typically leave the nest about 10 to 12 weeks of age, and as they grain gator, uh, grain gator gain greater independence, their mother will actually feed the chicks sporadically about three months, and then they're off to do their thing. So uh, also cool as well is that these guys are quite long-lived. Uh, so most parrots generally most long-lived, but they believe to be average about 60 uh, years old. Minus 20, and they tend to be adolescents before they start breeding. So males will start booming about five years of old age, and females reach sexual maturity about nine uh, years of age. But five-year-old breeding females have been reported. Uh, they do not breed every year and actually have the, one of the lowest reproductive rates among birds, which was fine in a uh, New Zealand that was full of not many predators, and such long-lived animals that could potentially live over 100 years. Um, but it's an issue when you've got lots of little mammals running around. And this also coincides with the uh, trees masting season. So every few years, trees will mast and produce, especially rimu. They like to rely on rimu to help uh, breed. And they typically, these rimu masts only really happen every three to five years. So their breeding coincides with that. Which is a little bit of a bad thing, which is not the bad thing. It worked for them, but because of all these introduced predators, now it's like a big issue. Another really interesting aspect as well, they actually can change the sex ratio of their baby, uh, babies, depending on their condition. So a female in good condition will produce males, 
So uh, because she has more resources, she can invest them in having bigger males because uh, males are bigger and need to be bigger to breed. So she can have males if she's good in good condition. But if she is a little bit like skinnier, not too good, she'll produce more females since females don't need to be as big. They don't require as much resources to uh, grow and reproduce uh, females and males. And this has actually been an issue sometimes because uh, even in the wild, they were supplementing uh, kakapo, um, uh, you know, supplement feeding them to help them breed. And they were producing all males. And it was like, why are we not getting many females? So they actually had to cut back on that a little bit to help uh, the females. Like, I actually have to be a little bit uh, in bad condition or not quite in good condition to produce all these males. So they, now they produced more females and now the gender ratio has kind of fixed itself again. In terms of feeding these guys, as I mentioned, they have a very small gizzard actually compared to other birds, but they are entirely herbivorous. They eat about 25 different plant species that's been recorded, and there's been lots of research looking into the coprolites of kakapo that have preserved poo, and they've also been seen eating all sorts of things like native mistletoes, things like that, and all sorts of different things. So now we get to talk about their conservation stories. So in terms of the fossil record, they seem to be the third most common bird in New Zealand, living all across New Zealand, but now they're sadly considered... Uh, rated, uh, critically endangered so there's only at the moment 250 left or about 247 but most dire point there was about 50 or so left and they were actually thought to be extinct too so we'll talk about that so the first decline of the kakapo happened around when the maoris came around about 700 years ago they seem to be still quite common around those parts they were used for cloaks and things like that and were easy food for maori and their dogs so some people kept them as pet but also the clearing of forests reduced their population but even though their population was reduced by Māori settlement, they actually were still quite common uh, up until hum uh, Europeans came along, and then it declined was much more rapid. So once the, uh, uh, obviously the people, uh, uh, Pākehā or Europeans came, they cleared a lot more land for grazing. They also released cats, rats, and stoats that ate the babies. And since they weren't used to all these melamalian predators that really for the decline especially with the re reintroduction of like mustelids uh, well, the introduction of mustelids that prey upon kakapo and also competition from deer as well for browsing is another big issue so sadly they then they were considered extinct uh, for a while in 1891 there was est established real resolution islands nature reserve to uh, where richard henry was actually a caretaker there and brought kakapo and brought all sorts of kiwi to that island he actually moved more than 200 kakapo to that island but sadly by 1900 so uh, stoats actually swam there and wiped out their population within six years which was really sad but then 1903 there were three kakapo moved from resolution island to little barrier but feral cats were there and got them so, um, but then in the 1950s, they tried to establish more efforts to try and protect them, out looking for them. They actually thought extinct for a while. There was some catching of them. And in the early 1970s, we're like, we don't know if they're extinct or not. Uh, they're still alive or whether they're extinct. But then they managed to find some such as Richard Henry, which was the uh, very famous kakapo, one of the last Fjordland kakapo found. But then luckily, and before 1997, there were sightings of kakapo on Stewart Island, which is a small island at the bottom of New Zealand. And there was a population with females. So the ones they had been catching from Fjordland were only males, but then they found a population with females as well. So then what they did was took all the... Uh, they were actually going to get attacked, killed by cats. They were declining really fast because cats were killing them. So they decided to take all the kakapo from both Fjordland, or the males, and the breeding females and males from Stewart Island and put them on Codfish Island or uh, to and also really got rid of Kiori rats on there. So it was safe from most predators except Kiori, but then they eventually got rid of the Kiori uh, or Polynesian rats from there. So that was like a safe breeding island for them. And the populations increased. So at that time, there was no more than 50, but then the population is kind of now uh, really in the past like 50 years, it's really been increasing. So between 1989, they really uh, helped uh, with it was supplementary feeding, but also monitoring and things like that and managing their nests. So one of the, they're actually quite intensely managed. So a lot of people, they'll take them out and incubate them, then put them back. There's also trapping and things like that. Though the islands are now rat free, monitoring and reintroductions into all sorts of different places around uh, New Zealand, such as uh, uh, Little Barrier or Aoturu. Uh, they've been reintroduced there once it was predator free. Uh, other islands, and also recently, just last year, Magatoturi, which is a big island, uh, like a mainland island in the middle of New Zealand, been there. It's a really cool place. They've reintroduced Kakapo there, though they are jumping out a bit, they've been parachuting out of the place but there's still a couple there's few there at the moment so there's been lots of reintroductions monitoring that each bird has a gps so you can track them uh also nest management eggs are taken out of uh and incubated and then put back to their parents they even have smart eggs so these are eggs that are 
like um, typically with captive birds, uh, typically they take the eggs out and then put a fake egg for them to incubate. But these ones also have like a, a speaker in them, so they produce baby kakapo sounds. So the parents know when to get ready for them to hatch, which is quite interesting. So lots of these efforts and lots of rangers tracking them and monitoring them to help breed them. And luckily, these efforts have been paying off. So at the beginning, the population about 1975, uh, at the lowest point was just about uh, 50, 40, 50. But now, especially from 2000, the population have been greatly increasing. So now we've got about just under 250 kakapo now. So even the past 20 years has been really great. And hopefully this it's going to carry on. So there's like lots of investment in them. So they are really, really cool. And they are quite famous. There's Sirocco, you know, the these are kakapo that, um, uh, you know, uh, humped the cameraman. Uh, they, that was really cool. And they're considered the bird of the year. They've been featured on a few different documentaries. Uh, and quite important multi culture as well. They were often considered pets. They were, you know, when they were more common, they were also eaten as well. Their feathers were used for cloaks and things like that. So quite important for uh, the culture of New Zealand as well. And just a really interesting species in terms of its evolutionary history and its ecology. And a species really worth saving. And that's kind of why it's uh, just an animal that just uh, represents New Zealand very well. And um, we probably say even better than the kiwi sometimes, but. It is what it is. Um, and yeah, that's part of the reason why I love them so much and why they are the banner of my channel. So it's really, really nice after three years that we finally got a Kakapo mod. And thank you, Great Cake Mods. I know I've been talking about these guys for a long time, but really, really awesome. So I think this is a great place to finish up. So um, yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys have enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified below anything. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed this video, hope you guys like and subscribe and bye-bye.